Did for what? Church. It says we're live on Facebook, so we're live. Welcome to All everyone. Right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm pulling up Facebook now so I can see who's on and say hello. Morning. Morning, everyone. So far, oh, it still surprises me that there's a, what do you call it, captions, which is awesome. But you know what? It doesn't save them. Like if you watch it back. In, oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. So hello to friends watching. We are in the throes of summer, which in our community means people peace out. <laughs> we have let go of all shame and guilt about missing church. And we're like, peace, see you in the fall. Get it, peace? No. Um, so for those of you who are in town or who are at home this morning joining us, thank you for being with us uh, in this little sacred, intimate space we're creating together. Um, let's see. Good morning to Clark and Sarah, Veronica. Thanks for watching. We've got a guest today, guest preacher, who is one of our own. So it's not really fair to call me a guest preacher. You're guest preaching, am, uh, but you're not yeah, a guest. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, so David's preaching this morning. So excited to hear from him in a bit. And of course, you can see all of our amazing leader, element leaders today. Woohoo! Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, while we wait for people to sign on, good morning, Jet. Um, what do you have for communion today? Here, let's set that down so you can show us. Show us your communion, Temple. I have kombucha and a candy cane. Kombucha and a candy Yes, girl. Cane. Absolutely. So I got who... coffee and bacon. <laughs> coffee and bacon. I've got an almond and coffee. Cozy, what do you have? Hold up your element. A sucker, a lollipop. Okay. Yes, girl. <laughs> Anyone else have anything interesting? Who who can surpass kom kombucha in a, in a candy cane? That is like the I'll best a, mix. Banana bread coffee, but that can't surpass. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks y'all for joining us. Uh, I'm going to give some announcements while we wait. I wanted to tell everybody that there is a coloring page linked in the guide. Oh, let me link the guide. Here, let me move this out of the way. I need my arm. Okay, I'm going to link to the guide here in just a sec. Give me just a second. Matthew is on his Air Force weekend and he is my linker. So I'm not used to not having someone to throw all the links out there. <laughs> Wait, he does the Air Force? He does. Okay. Clark's got cold brew and a cherry tomato. Sarah's got a ginger snap and a smoothie. How do I pin my own comment? I don't know. Can y'all see? Can everyone see the link? It's there. Here, Cozy, show us what you're coloring. Show us. This is the link. This is the link for the kids. The egg. Why you printed it? Those are aprons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're eggs. So Joyce is going to talk to the kids about this in just a sec. So check that link out. I tried to pin it. Maybe I can pin it in. Whoops. Oh, okay. I did it. I pinned, I pinned the link to the guide. Y'all let me know in the comments if you don't see it. Okay. Oh yeah, it's pinned. Way to go. Okay. So this Sunday, a week from today, our Naked Now Richard Rohr book club is meeting for part two. It is such an easy read. You did not miss anything. I mean, you missed a lot. You miss a lot of fun um, if you didn't come to the first one, but you can still come to the second one. It's not like one of those things where you won't know what we're talking about. So get that book from your local bookshop or go to bookshop.org and rush it um, or wherever you need to get it. Read it on your Kindle because it's such a good book. And we're in part two a week from today on Sunday. You can DM us if you're not on our email list for all the details of everything we have going on at any given point. We send out a weekly email and that's kind of how you, you know it all. Um, a week from today, we have another guest preacher, Reverend Kendall Rothis is going to yes. be preaching. I asked her uh, what she thought Paul had to say about women. <laughs> and I asked her if she could write a sermon on it. <laughs> so she'll be here in a week for that. 
Um, her book is coming out next month called Thy Queendom Come. Yeah, so yeah. we invite you to look that up and pre-order it because she is yeah, one yeah. of the best of the best feminist theologians and amazing preacher. So join us back in a yeah, week yeah. for that. Um, and then I think that's everything. Get your communion elements if you haven't. Am I forgetting anything, anybody at all? We have an in-person service coming up on July 20. Yeah, yeah. Fifth? Fifth. Yeah. So save the date for that. And yeah, yeah. we're excited for y'all to be here. Oh, okay. We've got some a tortilla and cranberry juice. Anybody else have ginger snap and smoothie, cold brew and cherry tomato? Mm, I like the cherry tomato. Nice. <laughs> okay. All right, Temple is here. She's going to help us chime today. So we invite you into this space to ground yourself, listen to the chime, take some breaths, and we're grateful that all of you are here this morning. Hey, I think it's, I'm up. I'm not sure if I'm, <laughs> hey, Cozy. <laughs> okay, um, well, you know, that was beautiful, Temple. You did such a good job, and it really helped me to breathe deep and prepare, you know, for my sermon. I get a little nervous when I'm getting on here, so I don't know how you felt, but you did a great job. So, um, well, okay. I'm Joyce Holly, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about change. And one of the things that I think of when I think of change is butterflies, because I think about how amazing it is that a butterfly lays a little egg on a leaf, right? And then that egg hatches, and out comes something that, look at that, has tentacles and little tiny feet, and it's long, <laughs> and it crawls around on leaves. It's a caterpillar, right? But then that caterpillar will eat and eat and keep getting bigger and grow stronger. And then he's going to attach himself to a, to a plant. And he's going to make this covering for himself called a chrysalis. And while he's in that chrysalis, there is some major stuff going on, right? Because when he pops out, when that chrysalis pops open, look at what comes out. It started like this and it turns into this. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So I get, I, I, but you know what else is amazing, guys? You are. Can you uh, just imagine how much you have changed since you were babies? I mean, look, when you were a baby, you couldn't walk, you couldn't talk, you couldn't feed yourself. You probably, at first, you couldn't even hold your head up. Somebody had to support your head with their hand. And you have grown and changed so much. And, you know, that's going to happen since you were first babies. And that, and you're, you're still changing every day. You're growing and learning new things and just becoming these new little people that your parents and your grandparents and all of your church people and all of the people who love you are just amazed at, right? So changing and growing are a big part of life, right? For, you know, some, we, we grow, some things happen just naturally, right? Like some mornings you wake up and your mom will say, did you go overnight? You just look bigger. Or some things happen, you know, that's because that's what our bodies do, right? They, as children, they just grow taller. And some things happen from effort. Like you might have to, you'll, your muscles will get bigger because you practice hard at learning a new skill like dancing or soccer. Um, 
you might, and you're gonna, you learn how to keep your balance on a bicycle. Maybe you start out on with training wheels, right? And then suddenly you're able to ride it without those training wheels because you're getting stronger and you're getting better to hold, able to hold your balance. And sometimes we start out as little kids and we get real angry at stuff and we don't want to share. But have you noticed sometimes as you, you're growing and you're making yourself share even when it's hard, right? Or you're, you're remembering to say something kind to somebody if they feel bad. And you're practicing those kinds of things and you're becoming a more, you know, a more thoughtful person. And that's changes that are going on inside of you. And it's just amazing all of these things that are happening inside of you and we and um, all of these things that are happening inside of you and for us to be, uh, you know, all of the people who are witnessing it. And so I just want you to, you know, think about change as something that happens naturally, right? It happens through effort. Like when you do your best, you're working hard to be the best dancer or soccer player or color the best picture or make the, or anything that you're trying hard to learn how to do. So, and all of these changes are taking place over time and they're making who you, who you are and who you're gonna become. Well, this, this summer, we have been talking about the Apostle Paul. And Paul is a guy who went through a lot of changes. When we, and about half the book of Acts is about the adventures of Paul. He was in a shipwreck, he was arrested for preaching, and then escaped when an earthquake happened. I mean, there, he has a great adventure story if you ever wanna just read it sometime in the book of Acts. But when the story begins, Paul is going around persecuting and putting people in jail who believe in Jesus. And he thought those people were dangerous and needed to be killed even. But then Jesus spoke to him on the road on, when he was traveling on his way to a town called Damascus. And Paul became a believer in Jesus too. And that was a huge change for Paul. And after Jesus spoke to him, Paul spent three years studying and praying and trying to understand and he didn't need to follow this long set of rules to be a child of God. And he, he came to understand that God loves all people and wants everyone to be his children, not just people who are, who, who, who are following the Jewish faith like he did. And he started traveling around all kinds of countries just to tell people that Jesus was God's son and God wants everybody to be his children and he loves them dearly. And without those years of study, without that effort, Paul might not have been able to change to the person that God could use, right? To spread his message and his story of Jesus. So all of you out there are like the butterflies. You're changing every day. And you're like Paul. Be proud of all the ways you've changed and grown so far. And look forward to all the ways you're gonna grow and develop as you get older. Work hard to learn new things and reach your goals. And believe me, all the people around you, the people who love you are enjoying watching you grow and become that unique person that God made you to be. So change, think about yourself. You're growing up, right? You're like that caterpillar turning into a butterfly. So have a good week, everybody. Love y'all. Thank you, Joyce. Appreciate that message. Uh, we're gonna be turning now to think about communion, but I'm gonna take the long way around, but don't worry, I'll eventually get there. Several weeks ago, I came across an article on the NPR website dealing with new scientific thought about emotions. The article described things as if uh, the scientists that come up with ways of thinking that nobody had ever uh, come up with before, uh, though I could recognize that the roots of their ways of thinking were actually in the 19th century in the philosopher William James. But despite my quibbles, I thought it was a really good article. If you want to uh, find this article, you can search Science of Emotions NPR or Emotions and Happiness NPR. One of the takeaways of this article was that uh, we potentially have more control over our emotional lives and over the relation between our emotions and happiness than most of us realize. Sometimes people think of emotions as something that just happens to you. 
you feel fear or anger or some other state, and it's all beyond your control. But apparently some scientists have begun to recognize that we're not just passive recipients of emotions. We, um, our emotional responses depend to a large extent on meanings that we assign to bodily states. Here's an example that comes from the article. Imagine that uh, in your vicinity, you come across a bear. Your heart starts to beat faster. Your, your, your breathing starts to be heavy and the adrenaline starts, starts to flow. So you feel fear, right? Well, maybe, but not necessarily. If you come from a family of hunters and you've often feasted on bear meat, you might have the same physiological response, but an entirely different emotional response. So the point is that what emotions you experience depend not just on the immediate situation, but on the experiences and memories that you bring to that situation. The lesson for all of us in this is that we can sometimes prepare ourselves to have more positive emotions in cases that could have evoked negative emotions. And by doing so, we can improve the quality of our lives. Suppose you habitually respond with something like irritation or frustration when everything's don't, things don't work out just as you wanted them to. Um, maybe, for example, your Zoom uh, connection is a little garbled and you're annoyed at it. With a kind of different mindset, you might respond to that same situation with gratitude or awe that it's even possible to have a connection with distant people like we have. The way you respond depends to a large extent on whether you've developed habits conducive to experiencing positive emotions. If you've become skillful at practicing positive emotions, then you're more likely to experience them. I don't think this is a new idea. I think I was told from a very young age to do things like count your blessings, to be thankful, to notice all the things that good things that come into your life. So people have known for a long time that some things you do can affect the quality of your experience. I'm not gonna to try to define precisely what a positive emotion is, but I wanna suggest that positive emotions involve a shift from thinking about just me and my problems. Examples would include feeling gratitude for the good things that come into your life or feeling, oh, it's something magnificent or something intriguing. There's a positive emotion that I don't have a good name for, but it's the kind of thing that I experience when I see someone doing something kind or good or generous for another person. For lack of a better word, I'm gonna call this uh, a sense of elation. The point here is that you can train yourself to have more positive emotional responses. I don't claim that you can eliminate all of the negative emotions altogether. And I don't think that that would even be a good thing if you could do it. But I do claim that you can engage in practices that keep you from jumping too quickly into a kind of egocentric uh, uh, pattern of thinking and feeling. When I say you can train yourself, I mean that you can cultivate the kind of thinking that's conducive to feeling thankful. You can seek out the kinds of experiences that produce feelings of awe. You can attend to the kinds of events that might evoke a sense of elation. So what does all this have to do with communion? Communion, I think, is a practice that helps to prime us to, uh, to, 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 to think in a way that ordinarily produces positive emotions. When we take communion, we are receiving a kind of gift that naturally evokes a sense of gratitude. When we see in the life of Jesus, that Jesus shares with us a sign of what the creator is like, we open ourselves to a response of awe. When we focus our attention on Jesus's willingness to give of himself, the result can be elation. I'm not saying that shaping our emotional lives is the only thing that communion does, but uh, I am saying that it's one of the ways that we can cultivate a sense that uh, increases or enlarges our capacities for experiencing the good things in life. So when we eat this bread and when we drink this wine with an awareness of what we're doing, 
let us do it so with a kind of awareness that we're that this can be part of a transforming process. I invite you now to join with me in the liturgy of communion. And I'll say the words that on your worship guide are in um, light print, and uh, you can repeat with me the words in dark print. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them we to, lift the Lord. Them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give it is our right thanks to give our and pray. And pray. The Lord is with gratitude that we eat bread and drink wine as a sign of what you have given to us. Cultivate within us the capacity to receive the kind of life that you give to us. Now join with me in receiving the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has Christ died. Has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Is risen. Christ, will come, Christ again. will come again. Amen. Are you there? I'm here. Is it my turn? Lyle, are you there? Okay, uh, I'm here. I'm singing an a cappella song today. Apologies, we don't have any music, but Lyle, here it there? goes. Okay, uh, I'm here. I'm singing an a cappella song today. Apologies, we don't have any music, but Lyle, here it there? goes. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. So sweet. Oh. 
longing for to carry me home. They were coming for to carry me home. Thank you, Lyle. That was beautiful. So Wonderful. good. Yes. Um, you all, when we were like in that in-between moment where yeah. nobody was going yet. <laughs> okay, say, say hi. Hi, Daddy. <laughs> okay if anyone can read lips what did I just say um whenever we weren't sure who was going and David was on the screen and Lyle was just there and I was there like you, no one else could see anyone but David but everybody was perfectly still like newscasters when they know something's gone wrong but they just <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny okay so we are doing a deeper look today with one of our very own beloved community members who is also the guest preacher for today, Reverend David Stipik. And because he has done a deeper look before where, I mean, I honestly don't remember when, so people would have to probably dig for it. Get it? Dig. Dig deep. Hey. Um, we're going to ask some new questions just for him to go a little bit even deeper. Uh, so David, here's the first question. You had time to prepare for all of them. They kind of sound, they kind of sound like really deep. Like, do we, yeah, Matthew, Matthew really went in on me. Matthew made these questions and I'm, I'm kind of, we probably don't have time for bonus questions so that you have space <laughs> to answer these questions. We'll I'll see. be as succinct as possible. Okay. Tell us about your sense of calling to ministry and how that has evolved over time. Yeah, uh, uh, until the last year or two, I would have said that I was 21. I was getting ready to uh, go on a, a year-long mission experience with the organization called, uh, very appropriately, Mission Year. Um, and I had been, up to that point, really interested in pursuing a career in law enforcement. Uh, and we were at an event with uh, some missionary friends from our church, and that was where I really felt like, yeah, it's this, you know, it's this pivot into a, uh, you know, vocational ministry call. But one of the things that I've been able to identify in the last year uh, with uh, my therapist and with uh, some other, through some other conversation is that I was actually eight years old and my mom and my sister are tuned in this morning. Hi, y'all. Uh, and so, you, mom, you may remember um, or, or, you know, in general uh, of these events, we, we, when, when I grew up, I grew up in, in the Roman Catholic church and we went out to um, a church on a little map dot outside of Gerald, um, Jordan's called uh, Corn Hill um, as Holy Trinity Catholic church. And we would do a chili cook-off every uh, October. And uh, it was an evening thing, have fires, bunch of chili, you try the chili, that kind of thing. And I remember having this conversation with our priest, and I don't remember what the conversation was, uh, but, but feeling so important because he was taking the time to just sit down and talk to me. And in, in that moment that I had this identification with his collar and his uniform and what that meant, uh, and that that was something I wanted to do. That was something I wanted to participate in. Um, and so that, that probably would be really the first time uh, you know, move forward into doing some different things and some of the helping, uh, you know, traditions and things like that. But really then uh, at 20, 21, feeling that, that call to, yes, I want to work in, in ministry. And so now that you're 22, you finally, just kidding, you didn't. Yeah, golly. <laughs> there's been, there's been some, there's been so much too. I'm sure that you're leaving out all that to say. Well, oh, okay. The next question, what has surprised you most about trying to follow Jesus over the years? Oh, um, uh, how difficult it is uh, when, when we move aside from, and I'll talk a little bit about this this morning, but, uh, and, and it's a, a tangent that I've been, line, been on, if you're uh, friends with me on social media, um, I get real uh, sweary on Twitter, um, but uh, you know, 
I I uh, I said this week some to somebody that they're fetishizing the Bible um, because <laughs> um, I, I love the Bible and I think it's great and I think it has great wisdom for us and and uh, things like that. But it's it's in the Gospels where we see the model that Jesus gives us of how to live that I think a lot of times we gloss over. Uh, and so over the last, really just even in the last three and four years of going, yes, the Bible's great. Uh, you know, I, I spent the last year as a, as a Bible teacher in a high school, okay? Um, but, and and it's, it's wonderful and there's tons of stuff in there, but w- what are these uh, gospels? And really for me, primarily looking into the Sermon on the Mount, right? This, uh, you know, whether that's, you know, a, a single one time Jesus sat down and did all these teachings or a compilation of them, whatever, going, yeah that's hard to do. Uh, and, and that's where, that's what I want to try to do. Okay. Last question. Thanks for sharing, by the way, how have you grown and changed during your time at peace? Um, so I thought a lot about this one, particularly this week, the other two were, were pretty easy for me to answer. Um, and the, the, probably the biggest and best thing that's happened for me here at peace of Christ is that I feel much more comfortable and confident uh, to believe what I believe, uh, to practice what I practice, and for that to change, <laughs> to, to be able to grow. Uh, and, and that's not something that I've felt welcome to do in other faith communities that I've been a part of. Uh, and to say, uh, yeah, this isn't a static thing. It's going to grow and change. And again, part of what Joyce talked about in the children's sermon, part of what I'm going to talk about today in my sermon. And so, um, you know, a place where, you know, someone who has had a, you know, an op- open table theology for four or five years, uh, but not been in a place to practice that, you know, and coming to peace and being able to genuinely say, uh, yeah, we don't care. Uh, if you're a human being, you can come to the table. Uh, and quite frankly, if we brought our dogs, I'm sure we wouldn't have a problem with that, you know, just that uh, anybody can come. Um, and so things like that, that, and not so much that I feel like, you know, and again, I talk a lot about online spaces that if I say or do something that I'm going to, you know, get this, you know, group of people that's going to come and back me up, but that because I have this group of people, I do feel more comfortable in saying, no, I think we have to look at it X, Y, and Z and not just uh, A. Those are my answers to your questions. Thank you for sharing. And we did used to have a blessing of the animals Sunday service every year for like a while. (laughs) So you technically could bring your dogs. <laughs> um, okay, well, we look forward to hearing from you uh, a little bit more just after this, this reading, but thank you for, for going even deeper with us. And we're really grateful for you and Hillary and your whole family being a part of our community. All right. Hi, I'm Deborah, Deborah Jordan, and I'll be doing our scripture reading today. Um, I'll be reading from Amos 7, verse 7 through 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by, pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. We hear the voice of God through these words. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. All right, I'm going to read for us out of uh, Ephesians. That's where my 
sermon text is going to come from this morning. It's from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. I'm reading out of the New Revised Standard. Um, that's right, yeah. Uh, this, is, this is my, uh, when you go to Bible college in your freshman year, they make you get this Bible. Uh, and then you use it sometimes, and sometimes you want to throw it against the wall. Uh, what I really want is, uh, you know, Trey shared uh, online this week, that he, he got his copy of the Inclusive Bible, and I know there's several others in our community have that. That's um, a Bible that I'm planning to get soon. Um, sorry, Hillary. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, uh, it says, Paul, and he says, Blessed be the God and, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. That's my bad. Um, set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance, toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Um, so I, I started recording there in the middle of my scripture reading Aurelia, so that's my bad. And I don't know if everybody else heard the uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, Zoom added that feature, uh, you know, for legal reasons. Um, so sorry about that, y'all. Um, Real excited to be able to preach this morning. I always love when I get a text from Aurelia and it says, do you want to preach in a couple of weeks? And I say, yes, I do. Um, so I'm going to talk this morning about Paul and his blessing time. Uh, I loved what Joyce said about uh, the, the time and, and the change of the, uh, you know, from the laying of the caterpillar egg to becoming a butterfly and then that cycle restarting. And so as we've been moving through our series about Paul, um, if, if you were at our one-time Paul discussion event a couple months back, or if you've been online with us or in person with us a couple weeks back, you probably know that I have some of my own uh, thoughts and sets of issues with Paul uh, and Paul's teaching and, and things like that. Um, but, but one of the best ways that I heard it described on a podcast several months back, and I, and I went in, uh, my 11th graders who I taught uh, this last year, the epistles, uh, were and are convinced that I hate Paul. And I would always say, I don't hate Paul. And they would say, but, which is absolutely accurate. Uh, but I heard this on a podcast over a weekend and I came in on, on Monday and I wrote it on the board. It says, um, Jesus is God and Paul ain't. Uh, that's my issue. Um, and, and I think what a lot of us maybe in the peace community have observed and experienced in other faith communities is that we'll read Jesus through the lens of Paul and not read Paul through the lens of Jesus. And that's something that has changed in me in the last several years. And so I do feel like that's what we've been doing in the last couple of weeks here is, is reading Paul through the lens of Jesus and making that our priority. And I hope to contribute to that this morning. When Aurelia first asked me if I wanted to preach, uh, I, I, I went up to her in our in-person service several weeks back. Said, hey, you know, is, is, do you want me to, to just do lectionary? And she said, I can do whatever I want. And that's a very dangerous thing to tell me. Uh, and so I thought, oh, I'm going to craft a really beautiful and wonderful sermon about how Paul was awful in the beginning and how he got a little better over time. And then I felt like that was a little vindictive. And I remembered uh, that, that my pastor in, in Brownwood, uh, who, who really was the person that introduced me to the lectionary as an adult, 
uh, said that the reason he liked the lectionary is that it forces us to, to use text that we may not want to use, maybe text that we don't like, uh, or text that we just don't know what to do with. And that's what I experienced here. When I went to the lectionary text, it wasn't something that I disliked or had a problem with. I was like, I don't, I don't have to do with this. And so I had to read it and read it again and some more and read some commentary and some online sources. And, and uh, what I was looking for was a through line. What's happening? What's going on? And I, and I found it. Uh, and it was time. Paul is blessing God for time. Now, hold on before you say Paul is blessing God. That doesn't make sense to most of us. Uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians opens differently than some of his other letters, right? A lot of times he's uh, hey, you guys, how's it going? I'm Paul. I'm an apostle for Christ, which we get right in verses one or two. And then he either launches into, in case you don't know who I am, I used to kill you guys all the time, but I don't kill you anymore because I'm one of you now. Or he just jumps in and he's like, y'all are insane and you're going to stop doing these things. And I'm going to spend the next part of this letter lining all of that out. He doesn't do that here. He, he starts with a blessing uh, but he's not blessing, he's not giving a blessing to the Ephesians, he's blessing God. And if that feels weird to you, it felt weird to me too. So I looked it up on jufac.org, okay? That's just what I found. I Googled it. Uh, I Googled this word, barakah, uh, which is that the, which is the, this Hebrew word for blessing um, that, that's going on here. Uh, so don't let ministers and pastors fool you. We just Google stuff when we don't know what it is. Um, and so Here's what it had to say. It said, many English-speaking people find the idea of the uh, barakah very confusing. And I'm butchering that word, by the way. Uh, to them, the word blessing, to us, uh, the word blessing seems to imply that the person saying the blessing is conferring some benefit on the person he's speaking to. For example, in the Catholic tradition, a person making a confession begins by asking the priest to bless them. Yet in a barakah, the person saying the blessing is speaking to God. How can the creation confer a benefit upon the creator? This confusion largely stems from the difficulties in the translation, as do many things we deal with. Uh, the Hebrew word uh, bar baruka uh, is, is not a verb describing what we do to God. It's an adjective describing God as the source of all blessings. When we recite a barakah, we are not blessing God. We are expressing wonder at how blessed God is. So Paul is expressing, expressing wonder for the blessing of time here. That's what's happening. So I found that through line here in, in this uh, first verse where he's, he's blessing God for um, what's happened before the foundation of the world, before time existed in our conception. Uh, he's blessing God for the person and model of Jesus. And he's blessing God for the work being done to bring the world back to oneness with the divine. So that's, that's where we're looking at time and the way Paul is blessing God for that. So what I want to do is, as we examine time and, and come back around is, um, believe it or not, talk about some TV shows. Um, and again, if, if you know me even a little bit, you know that I watch far more TV than the average person. Um, and I'm okay with that. I've just accepted that that's part of who I am. Um, and so not just really kind of sprinkling it in. That's really what the whole sermon is based around. So buckle up. Um, we're going to get back around to, to what Paul is saying. I do want to say this. I'm talking about uh, the shows The Good Place and Ted Lasso because there's just no way that I'm going to do a sermon right now and not talk about Ted Lasso. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, Bo Burnham's inside uh, which is his current special on netflix and so if those are things that you haven't watched or are watching or planning to watch uh and and you don't want spoilers you can mute me when i get to that part and then i'll give you a thumbs up when i'm done i'm i'm fine with that i get it so this this first thing that i want to talk about uh is that time is ineffable we don't get it uh, and part of that is because it doesn't really exist and hillary hates when i say that things are construct uh construct but they just are, everything's a construct, nothing exists, we make it all up and that's fine. Uh, and so one of the best TV shows that I've watched in the last five or six years is The Good Place. And now I have this problem where I can't just watch a show, I will watch it over and over again. Uh, when I was younger, my older sister 
thought that Jonathan Taylor Thomas was a real hottie, so she would uh, record on VHS episodes of Home Improvement. And then I would just watch that VHS over and over and over again uh, to the point where twice she and my brother threw it away in the big dumpster outside and I went and got it. Uh, so when we, when Hillary and I finished The Good Place, kind of in the middle of quarantine, I then bought it on iTunes and watched it four or five times. I do not have the ability to just watch a show once. If you've watched The Good Place, you know that we're dealing with a lot of moral philosophy in that show, how that uh, should impact our lives, and then in the concept of this show, what that means for the afterlife, uh, and then what that even is. So what happens is that uh, our besties, die and they go to the afterlife and they are in the good place except then they find out they're really in the bad place and they get rebooted um, 800 some odd times over the course of about 300 years now at one point they get placed back into you know our timeline uh, to see if because of what they've learned they can then live out better lives that they can become better people uh when, when they're confronted with this by our sweet uh, fire squid demon, Michael, uh, they, they, they're like, hey, if, if we were rebooted 800 times, how long was that? He's like, oh, it was like 300 years. And they're like, then how did we get put back into the timeline where we were? And so Michael explains to them about the timeline in the afterlife, which, which they call Jeremy Baramy. And I'm going to show it to you here real quick. Um, and so you can see it, uh, and I want to share that. There you go. So this is uh, what is, is, again, in the concept of this show, the, the timeline of the afterlife. Um, so you can see that, that graphic there. Um, and it's probably my favorite fictional conception of time that I think could actually be the way that time probably works. Uh, and it it cracks me up, particularly when Chidi, who is really our moral center of the show, asks uh, Michael what the little dot over the eye is. And Michael and Janet say, oh, that's Tuesdays and also July and sometimes never. And then Chidi has this breakdown uh, and it's just delightful. And so, so while in the universe of, of the good place, this is how the timeline in the afterlife works, I can't help but feel like this is really how God, the divine, experiences time, that everything has happened intertwined and that we cannot understand that. So what the good place has taught me is that time is not understandable. It is ineffable. I, I'm not going to grasp the way that it actually works outside of, you know, our calendar and our tracking of time and things like that. The other thing that time allows us to do is, is to examine the trajectory of our own selves. And so uh, again, is, in keeping with the idea that I'm not able to watch a show once a couple weeks ago, uh, my sister-in-law, Hillary's sister was in town visiting us and uh, she asked us if, us if we had watched Ted Lasso. I said, no, we haven't. And uh, so over the course of two nights, one night we watched episodes one through five and the next night we watched episodes six through 10 because we were just that engaged with it. It is so good. If you have not watched Ted Lasso, you should either buy a new Apple device so you get a year of Apple TV Plus for free or do the seven day free trial, whichever one of those things makes more sense for you. Um, and you can watch Ted Lasso in seven days, I promise you. So Ted Lasso stars Jason Sudeikis. And again, if you're like, hey, no spoilers, you should mute me right now. Ted Lasso stars Jason Sudeikis playing this D2 college football coach who is then hired to go teach foot or not teach coach a football team in England, you know, like what we call soccer. And he has, he has, doesn't know anything about soccer, has never played it, has never watched it, does not know anything. And so, uh, you know, fun ensues. It's great. Now, what we find out is that one of the reasons he took this job is that He's, he's having some troubles in his marriage and he's trying to give his wife some space. So in episode five, she comes to visit and he really realizes that his marriage is over, that this giving space, the working on it is not going to do anything. It's not going to change anything. And he still has to go coach this crucial game. They haven't won a game yet. Uh, and in the middle of this game, he benches his star player. 
uh, who is a deal hole. Um, and so once they get into the locker room, they, they are doing poorly. He's benched this star player. Uh, people are not happy with him. He's realized, man, my, my wife being here is not helping. Our, our marriage is over. We don't get in this locker room, middle of the game scene, what we're probably used to in a scenario like this, in a movie, in a TV show, you know, the loud rousing, we can do this, we can beat them, everything's great. Uh, what we get is that Ted, Ted talks, that's pretty good. Ted speaks really calmly about change. And so this is what he says. He says, we need change. We need to change. And look, I know change can be scary. One minute you're playing freeze tag out there at recess with all your buddies. Next thing you know, you're getting dits, your voice gets low. And every time your art teacher, Mrs. Scanlon, leans over your desk to check and see how your project's going, you feel all squiggly inside. She was a striking woman, not classically beautiful, but striking. First time I ever saw tan lines. Most of the time, change is a good thing. Now I think that's what it's all about, embracing change. Ted is describing some feelings that we've all been through, not puberty, um, but this idea that, you know, he says one moment you're, you're out playing with your friends and the next you're having these feelings that you don't understand. But if you go back and track it, you go, oh, this happened and this happened and that's how I got to this place. He's, he's saying that change can seem sudden, but when we look back, we can actually track the trajectory of what brought that change on. And finally, um, Bo Burnham is a he's a kind of a musical comedian uh, if i'm not a big bo burnham fan I'll, I'll say that but i really wanted to watch this new special inside because what happened is that uh he, he took a break for about five years and uh because he had some uh he was having some mental health issues people online are not kind and so uh he was dealing with a lot of that and uh late 2019 early 2020 he was like you know what i'm ready to get back into it i want to do another tour it's going to be great and then you know COVID 19. And so what he did is that he writes, films, directs, and edits this comedy special in his tiny one-bedroom apartment over the entire course of quarantine. And I think that's why I identified with it. And I think, uh, listen, I'll give you my Netflix login if you want to watch this. It's great. Um, I think it's why you might identify with it, because the feelings that he's talking about, the emotions he's dealing with, were pretty common to a lot of us throughout quarantine. What's great about watching the progression of time through this, though, is, is not only watching his physical appearance, we see his hair get longer, we see his beard get longer, we see him lose some weight, and we see some physical change in Bo's body, but we see uh, what really appears to be the deterioration of his mental health, which again was a reality for a lot of us throughout the, the quarantine and, and throughout this pandemic. I told Hillary that if that part is an affectation uh, on his part, it's a damn good one. I mean, as somebody who, who deals with uh, some pretty severe uh, mental health, and, and I don't love the word issues, but we'll call it that because that's kind of the, the colloquial there. Uh, when I'm not, uh, you know, on some medication and in therapy, uh, I thought that's, that's what happens. That's how it feels. That's what's going on. And so I resonated deeply with what a lot of us I know were experiencing watching it happen right in front of us and time can take its toll on us it will change us it's not if it time changes us it's when it will so many of us in the peace of Christ community have experienced life change that brought us to this community we can look at pictures of ourselves from periods past and and point out some of the physical differences that we experience and we can describe times when we've been doing really well emotionally and mentally and spiritually and, and times where we have not been. And we know that time can change us. And sometimes it's quick and sometimes it's this drawn out process. So in this idea and these ideas that, that time is ineffable and it lets us track our trajectory and that it changes us, um, if we're, you're wondering what any of that has to do with uh, Paul's blessing here in the beginning of Ephesians is that, um, some of the things that it's important for us to understand about Paul and some of the other New Testament writers is that they would not have considered themselves to be writing scripture, sacred texts that we're going to be using for a couple thousand years. And part of that, well, they, they were sharing just communications for what they believed to be important ways for the, the, the new church to live out the model that Jesus gave them. 
But part of that is because uh, we can look at some interpretation now that probably says they thought Jesus was coming back then in their in their day in their time and so they wouldn't have thought that the letters and, and ideas they were writing were going to be used you know in perpetuity there, uh, we're not going to get into all that but in the beginning of this passage of this blessing paul is talking about god choosing humanity before the foundation of the world before time began and and i would ask myself the question about like what was before time was there time before time I don't know. I don't understand it because, like I said, time is ineffable. We don't get it. What I know is that in this blessing Paul is giving here, he wants us to know that at the beginning of time or before time existed, that there just was God and that God chose humanity as something good and worthy of the incarnation of Jesus who would come. And we know that because God can't participate in something that's not good. So God says humanity is good before there ever is humanity. In some conception of time, God has always been here and will always be here experiencing all the things all the time. And that's a God I don't understand. It's a conception of time I don't understand. But Paul wants us to be comfortable with that, to be thankful for that. And in the spirit of reading Paul through the lens of Jesus, the kingdom of God, as we like to call it here at peace, is, is here and now, and it will be forever. There is no end to it. And while we tend to understand that as having come with Jesus to us, if we were to look at time as happening through some kind of Jeremy Baramy, then I would say, when did that start and will it ever end? If that kingdom is here and now, how are we participating in it? Are we blessing others in the way we inhabit the world around us because of the work the kingdom has done in our own lives? Paul knew that time was ineffable and that we shouldn't waste it. Paul addresses that through the work and life of Jesus, which culminates in the, in the crucifixion, we have changed, we are being changed, and we will be changed. We can track that trajectory and who we are now and when we've taken that idea of living the Jesus model seriously, we can point to the immediate changes maybe that happened in some of our lives when, when we make that choice uh, that we've experienced. And we can see how it has shaped us over time. We're not just bystanders, bystanders in the kingdom. We're participants because Jesus invites us over and over to live in a particular way that quite frankly made no sense at the time he made the invitation, it continues to mark us a bit as oddball when we take that model for living seriously. Living the Jesus model will allow us to be changing forever. And what a blessing that opportunity is. Paul knew that we should be tracking the trajectory of our own selves as people following Jesus. And if change people taking Jesus seriously, many of us have rejected things like condemnation of differing sexuality and gender we've rejected strict and unchanging interpretations of the revelation of god to people the bible in favor of the jesus model of loving people as changed people taking jesus seriously through time many of us have chosen to come along beside the oppressed and reject the empires of nations and corporations Many of us have allowed ourselves to be open to other expressions of spirituality that bring a fullness to our lives we never could have imagined. And Paul knew that time and the experience we, we have over time would change us. Paul's blessing God for time. He couldn't have known how human consciousness would evolve in the next 2,000 years, but he knew that we don't understand time and what a gift it is that we can be thankful for the work left to us by Jesus to be part of bringing all of the created order back to oneness and wholeness with the divine. I don't know about you, but I don't have enough time to do all that that entails, but I know I have some time while I'm here. And this week, I spent some of that time working on myself, um, taking up bike riding for my physical health, uh, starting to do some inner child work, making time to play tennis with Riker so that we feel connected, practicing gymnastics with Harper for the same reason, and when she'll allow it, doing some cuddles with Carly. I make time to read, 
some fiction, which is something that I, that I love to do, but haven't always made good time to do. I try to use my time online, like I said, I'm, I'm very online, uh, to bolster the work of others and make sure that the people who interact with me, who wouldn't necessarily see or participate in some of the conversations that I do have that opportunity. So there's a lot that I don't like about Paul. There's a lot that I have trouble with that Paul says and teaches throughout the record of what we have. You may feel the same way, but he's helped me understand time and I bless God for that. And kick it over to Joel. Thanks for that, David. It's, uh, it's really encouraging being part of a church that is willing to examine people like Paul honestly instead of up on a pedestal. But it is a little discouraging knowing that I'm going to have to watch Bo Burnham now, which my buddy's been trying to get me to do for months. So <laughs> what are you doing to me, man? Um, please join me in litany for proper 10, year B, litany for the call. This is written by our own Fran. God, we know that living an authentic life, realizing our calling, awakening to our true selves, is risky, risky business. Is risky business. We have heard the stories of people who've been rejected by society, people, people who knew, people their, work who knew their work and purpose. Like John the Baptist, who was killed. Like, like the, the prophet Amos, who was, who was turned away. Who was turned away. Like Jesus, who preached peace and yet was put to death. And we we've also witnessed this pattern in our time. In our time. While most of us nowadays won't come to such dramatic ends, we understand we that, understand authenticity, that authenticity, authenticity often meets, often resistance. meets resistance. That people who choose to tend to their true purpose are often are scorned often when they refuse, when to, they refuse assimilate. to assimilate. So we ask for strength, courage, and clarity in hearing the in still, hearing the small, still voice small voice inside. Voice inside. In examining our societal programming, and realizing, and realizing our, gifts, our gifts, in aligning with our true purpose and true selves, in and creating, and creating authentic, authentic lives. lives. In any experiences of ridicule, resistance, or shaming, and following, and love's, following calling. love's calling. We know that we have received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We are co-inheritors co with, with Christ, in whom all things in heaven things and on earth and are, on gathered earth up. are gathered up. We are sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit. We are lavished with, we are wisdom, lavished with wisdom, insight, insight and the riches, and the riches, of, your riches of your grace. Everything we need, we've already been given. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's up to us to take hold of it, even yeah. if that means even we'll that encounter, means trouble. encounter trouble. Because we understand that nothing compares to the beauty and joy of a life aligned, of a life with, aligned love. with love. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, David, for your sermon and everyone who helped lead this morning. Um, for those of you watching, feel free to continue to follow us on social media or DM us if you're not on our email list. That's the best way to stay up to date with the in-person and virtual things that we have going on right now. Uh, I just want to invite everybody to participate in the benediction as well. I'll read all of it and you can respond in the bulb. Lord, you are ascending God. You sent your word to create. You sent Christ to reveal. You sent your spirit to empower. You sent your church to proclaim. Send us, O oh God, Send us, oh God, renew, the, renew earth. the earth. Lead us by your Lead spirit, by your spirit and, your and your word. As your people, we now As go. Your people, we now go. By our love, we'll, by make, our love, you we'll know. make you know. People of God, you are sent. Go in peace for peace. Amen.